So it's uh, my great honor to come here as the first uh, speaker about the um, cooperations between China and the Nordic countries. And so here, um, first I want to talk about the China's Arctic Silk Road cooperation with the Nor Nordic regions within this grand strategic relations. Um, first, I think that perhaps we need to um, get some understanding over some basic ideas. Uh, here I'm going to talk about the four points, uh, four aspects. The first is that um, about the uh, is about the connecting points about China's Belt and Road Initiative and the Europe's Eurasia Connectivity Strategy. And then I will just uh, focus on some internal and external factors that 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 actually influence or shape the cooperation between China and Europe, and particularly China and the uh, Nordic countries uh, in this field. And then we, I will take some review over the potential and the prospects of the um, China-Europe cooperation related to Arctic affairs. Um, as for the China's uh, One Belt, One Road Initiative, or Belt and Road Initiative in its official name, that this is a grand plan and here we can just have a look over all the major aspects of it. And here I make a summarization uh, according to my own understanding based on all the policy documents. And uh, here I think that this um, Belt and Road Initiative uh, actually involves many different aspects and also it is actually connecting with many different regions of the world. So this is a grand plan and this is a plan for the joint push, uh, joint promotion uh, of the regional and inter-regional and inter-regional uh, economic cooperation. So this is a grand plan, and it has it, it is it has already been uh, implemented or pushed forward for um, several years. And this is a, a, a general um, map showing the uh, general idea. And this is a grand plan. But also at the same time, um, there is a European plan for connecting the Asia and the um, and the Europe, and this is a document issued by the European Union, and uh, we could perhaps find some connecting points that could just offer some. Um, background and also some framework that could push forward the China and the Europe's cooperation uh, in this region. And the first I think that these are the several points that I uh, summarize is from the uh, major connecting points that could connect China's BRI with the Europe's Euro-Asia connectivity strategy. The first is that I think that both strategies to some degree emphasizes the uh, constructions of the infrastructure and particularly um, there is an emphasis on the transport, the inland transport. And also, I think that um, both strategies, um, from my understanding, also emphasizes some transport through the sea routes, uh, through the seas. And also, there is some joint investment on some important uh, infrastructure projects that could not only improve the transport, but also improve the energy uh, systems in this in some of the relatively underdeveloped regions or areas of the Euro-Asian continent. Uh, this is my understanding, of course, uh, any criticism or comment is, wel is welcome. And uh, for China, um, you know that Euro-Asia is a very large area. It covers a huge, huge area of the Earth. For China to export, to transport its commodities, its products to Europe, it usually is relatively a very costly um, task, and either through the sea route or through the railways. Uh, if it is through the railways, uh, we know that uh, actually in the year around the 2017, that there is a long-term uh, railway um, that already been put into implementation from the EU of the Zhejiang province of China all the way to the Madrid in Spain uh, that is actually connecting the different sections or points of the uh, existing railway to transport the China's commodity. Uh, Yiwu is a quite interesting and important city in the Zhejiang province of China. It is famous in China for producing some labor-intensive 
um, small products that seem to be small, but in, in EU it could be produced in large quantity and it find a large market in the Europe. But for every year, uh, relatively for every month, there will be large quantities of the products be transported from EU all the way to Europe. If it is through the sea route, it will be relatively um, through a long time. So um, from the China side, we think that perhaps we could just build a railway. But even this railway, it is still very long and it is still relatively costly. So that's the reason that uh, this is uh, the railway system. So that's the reason that we consider just why we could just perhaps to for some degree to shorten the sea route transportation. And because of this uh, consideration that the Arctic cooperation uh, enters into the agenda of the China's policymakers. And also we should think that uh, we should know that the Arctic region, um, and due to its commercial potential, has already attracted the attention not only from China, but also from um, Japan or South Korea. So it's a common interest in the East Asia region. Now, traditionally from the literature and from the um, practical um, records, uh, there are already several sea routes that are already identified in the Arctic region. And these sea routes seem to be relatively um, quite commercially profitable. And so not only China, I should say that, but also Japan, South Korea, for all these countries, they uh, relatively depend on export to push forward their economic growth. And so all of these countries actually are quite interested in just uh, pushing forward. And if we just uh, take a sea route, not through the south, through the Indian Ocean, but through the Arctic Ocean, um, perhaps the, the total length of the transportation will be greatly shortened. And if it is shortened, then it could be just it could save more cost and it could be more profitable. So, so there is a lot of discussion over the commercial potential or the commercial value of the sea routes of transportation of cargo ships uh, through the Arctic regions. So that's uh, the general background that China raised the idea or the concept of the Arctic Silk Road. But here uh, I'm not going to talk too much. Um, about the uh, specific technical points about this. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the, some of the more strategic factors that we need to take into consideration if we think that the Arctic cooperation between the China and the Europe could be viable, could be put into effect. So I think that we need to make some analysis over the domestic and the external factors that may shape, may influence or may restrict the cooperation between China and Europe on the Arctic affairs. I think that there are some domestic factors in the Europe from Chinese perspective that there are some factors um, in the domestic factors in the Europe that might just put some um, restricting force on the possible Arctic cooperation. The first is that we should notice that there is a trend of the widening disparities and the disputes in China and Europe, um, in particular in the relations of trade and investment between these two large, uh, large uh, economies. The second point is that the rising populism and nationalism in the Europe um, that might become relatively more increasingly hostile towards China's participation in the Arctic affairs. And third is that we should say that there, there is inevitable um, misinformation or misperception or misinterpretations uh, in the strategic assessments and orientations of both the China and the Europe that might put some restrictive force for the possible um, cooperation. Um, in the past uh, several decades, the China and the Europe's relations actually has experienced some change. Uh, originally, I think that in the um, 30 years from year 1979 all the way to the 2009, uh, there is a grand triangle and the flying geese pattern that exists in the ec economic relations between China and Europe and the other major economies uh, here. Um, the so-called Grand Triangle means that um, gradually since the year 1979, when the China adopted the measures of reform and opening, 
that China got itself more and more involved into the world economy. And because of its relatively huge labor force, uh, which is its which was its comparative advantage, that China offers cheap consumer goods to the Europe and the United States. Uh, also, at the same time, it imported uh, a lot of more sophisticated um, industrial goods, but not from the European Union or the United States, because the sophisticated in the industrial goods from the European Union and the United States were relatively uh, expensive. So China, mainland China, imported the technologies and the industrial goods from Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. And also at the same time, Japan, South Korea and Taiwan uh, imported some more expensive, relatively high-tech industrial goods from the European United States. This is a, a grand triangle in the 30 years from 1979 to the 2009. But everything always changes. Uh, you know that um, in, in the East Asia economy, there is a pattern which is called the flying geese pattern. This means that for each economy in the East Asia, they will not, they usually did not and would not stay on the same position in the global value chain. They will gradually manage to upgrade their position. And this is called the flying geese pattern. Um, I think that uh, the scholars of the uh, economic field may be familiar with this pattern. And uh, this pattern explains just uh, how the position of the different economies uh, was shifted um, in, its, uh, in, in, its total, um, uh, in, in the total economic pattern. And uh, here it shows just uh, how the uh, China's trade surplus or, or deficit uh, was, was formed. Uh, mainly, just again, it shows a long-term trend that the Europe and the United States traditionally were two largest markets that absorbed the China's cheap consumer goods, and also at the same time, um, here I mean mainly in China, also at the same time, the South Korea and Japan and Taiwan could gradually offer these industrial goods, sophisticated in industrial goods to China. But you could see that gradually, it just decreases. This, the, the, these lines is, uh, were on a decreasing trend, and this decreasing trend means that China already shifted its position. It's gradually uh, shifted and it became um, much less uh, stuck to the um, labor-intensive positions. And, well, uh, I think time is quite limited, but here, this is a statistics made by the United Nations. Um, here you could find that gradually, the uh, high-tech manufacturers uh, account for a larger and a larger share in the total export um, structure of China. And because of this shifting of the position, um, because of this shifting of the position, that gradually there are more and more trade disputes. And the Europe's uh, viewpoint, the Europe's, the general assessment of China has changed. And that is the reason that in uh, recent years, you could find the major uh, issues of disparities and disputes uh, in the China-EU bilateral relations, economic relations. Uh, these disputes or these disparities occurred in trade, in investment, in industries, and in high-tech uh, sectors. Uh, these could just uh, change the perceptions, and it could form some kind of the misperceptions um, from both sides toward each other, and that could put some restrictive force that may not be helpful to push forward the China-Europe cooperation. And also, uh, the rise of the populism within the Europe that might pose some hostility. I will not talk too much about this. Uh, so, and generally, I think there are several um, possible misperceptions and misinformations. Uh, first is that uh, the European Union is viewing China now particularly since the spring of the 19, 2019, as some kind of systematic rivals. And the second is that uh, the European Union as a whole, um, and particularly Germany perhaps, is becoming more negative towards China's uh, fundamental economic institutions. And uh, there are some divergences between China and Europe on some regional affairs in the East Asia. And because of this, these are the restrictive force. Um, but also, the, there are some um, positive force uh, that may help to push forward the China-Europe Arctic cooperation. The first is that I think that China and Europe, uh, both China and Europe, are the global are the winners to some degree, are the winners of, of the globalization. 
without the globalization, there will be no um, momentum of the European integration in the 1990s. And uh, the, because of this, uh, that in, in consideration of the retreat of the United States from the tide of the globalization, so that China and Europe share some common concerns uh, over how to push forward the globalization. And also, the China and the Europe uh, have shared some common desires to improve the multilateral trade system and the global governance. And the regional fears in the Arctic cooperation on the Arctic cooperation issues could be regarded as part of the um, global governance issues. So on, this, on these issues related to global governance, the China and Europe could share much more cooperation. And also I think that now on the Arctic regional affairs, it seems that the United States and Russia and Canada, these are the three most important players. And they perhaps um, to some degree um, share some momentum to, to some degree to monopolize the Arctic affairs. And both the China and the European countries do not want these largest powers, largest powers to monopolize the Arctic affairs. So this is a um, domestic factors. And as for the um, external factors, as for the external factors that are shaping the possible China and the Europe uh, Arctic cooperation, I think the most important factor is the United States. If you look at the United States, you can find that uh, the United States really has a very strong influence. Um, the strategic orientations from the Trump administration and the um, perceptional influence and also the trilateral strategic collaborations uh, with the, uh, between the United States, Europe, and Japan, all these are important factors that are uh, actually shaping the China-Europe cooperation, possibility of the more cooperation in the Arctic affairs. And, uh, and here, this is a, a table that I summarized over the influences of the United States over the Europe, um, particularly the economic nationalism, the state mercantilism and the protectionism that initiated by the United States and also influence uh, and influence the European perceptions. So these are the uh, factors of restrictions and factors of positive force. So how could we push forward the uh, cooperation on the Arctic affairs in the future? And here I think there are three directions that maybe we could consider to push forward our bilateral cooperation. First is the joint technological development. I think that technology could be much less sensitive, uh, could be much less ideological sensitive. Um, the techno uh, technological development for the maritime navigation and environmental protection and global climate governance. These, these uh, issues could offer some um, platform for more cooperation. And particularly now the Chinese scholars are also very interested in the global climate governance. So this means this, there is a potential. And also there could be some large scale projects for exploring natural, <coughs> sorry, natural resources. And also there could be more institutionalized cooperation between China and Europe and between East Asia and the Europe uh, in the Arctic Council and other international bodies. So I should say that Arctic region uh, is concerned not only by China, but also by many other East Asian countries. So this is a quite hot topic in the East Asia area. There could be more inter-regional cooperation. Okay, so this is, these are my points. Thank you very much. Okay.